Welcome to the weekly a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church with your hosts. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. So good to be with you this week. Looking forward to a great conversation we're going to have today with a good friend of mine. Zach is in the building. It's Monday morning. It is. And you brought coffee for exactly one person, I see. <laughs> That's because I brewed coffee this morning mm. and it's been just hanging on. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, to let you know, I didn't change my phone number or <laughs> my email or my personal email or my address. Oh. So lots of ways that you could have gotten a hold of me to see what uh, my coffee interest would have been. You know what? A true podcast host would have thought of that. Mm. If I had an executive assistant with the weekly, they would have thought of that. They'd also not be doing much for, <laughs> for a lot of the week. <laughs> hey, man. It's a busy podcast, okay? There's yeah. a lot of things happening in the podcast world. Yeah, every that's day. right. Hey, we're so glad you're with us today. You can go to calvarybible.com slash events, click your campus, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods, in your world. Calvary's doing a lot of great things that are all across all campuses in the coming weeks. We have win- women's retreat happening so you want to go sign up to there that's march 4th through the 6th we also have middle school winter week weekend you got it they spelled it the cool way yeah there's no vowels there's no vowels vowels are uncool yes they are yeah so that's february 11th 13th so that's coming up this next weekend if you got middle school students get them there that's going to be a great way for them to connect get known be known get to know the bible encounter jesus you want your middle schoolers there. I am always so impressed by our student ministry department. Oh, yeah. So when I see an event for them, like Iron Man's coming up too, mm-hmm. high schools, March 18th through the 24th, get your high school student there. That is a great trip. In fact, I went out to that trip, I don't know if you know that, about five years ago. Okay. Um, they flew me in to talk one night, which was really just fun. And um, it was a blast to hang out with high schoolers. Yeah. It's a really unique trip. It's like a, it's like, it feels like families on a big vacation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then they worship, they read the scriptures, they do some spiritual disciplines like silence and solitude and praying and reading their Bibles. It's awesome. That's real good. Yeah, man. So you've got to get on that trip someday, Zach. So I I don't think I'm allowed to ask this, and especially not while you're telling people what's coming up. Do you have a background in in student ministries? You know what? I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah, I did uh, almost five years in student ministries. It's great. Yeah, it was really fun. I actually, my favorite group of people to talk to are middle schoolers. Mm. The problem is I don't like the idea of like being responsible for them sure. on a trip or at an event. If I can show up and just hang out with them, that's the best gig in the world yeah. for me. I pull great. out my Star Wars t-shirts and my Marvel t-shirts and my maturity level. Just ask my wife. Is about middle school boy level. Yeah. So I really relate. Yeah. So I'm still elementary on maturity level. So <laughs> they're, they're too advanced for me. Totally. And your history. So I don't know if we've ever, have we talked about this on the podcast? Where you came from in California? What type of ministry you were doing before you came to Calvary? Uh, I don't know if we did. Yeah. Do, do you want to? Yeah, or did you just well. want to set it up and, and switch to something else? Yeah. So uh, born and raised Southern California. Uh, started working in uh, middle school ministry. Okay. Uh, three weeks <laughs> into my undergrad program at Biola. Cool. So, a church down the street, Whittier Area Community Church, was there about two years as a, a junior high intern. And there is no place lower on the church hierarchical totem pole <laughs> than junior high intern. I, I think I reported to like our custodial uh, yeah. team. Um, uh, no, I loved our custodian team because they they made it so I didn't lose my job after, <laughs> after spilling stuff and all kinds. So yeah, it, it's, it was a great entry point. Um, went from there to uh, student ministries in general, mm-hmm. had a two year set internship was a youth director after that for another two years out in Long Beach. Then I switched to, to young adults. Young adults kids ministry was mm-hmm. uh, at E.B. Free Fullerton for a year and a half, four years as a kids and then family pastor in Irvine, California cool, for four man. years. That's not a bad gig. Yeah. Irvine. And then uh, uh, it was there that I got connected to someone who uh, had known Gary, uh, who's originally from Irvine as well. Mm-hmm. And... Got told about this position at Thornton. Cool. Been here for a year and a month. Now. Wow. 
It's Very been good. cool, man. Yeah, so six years students, six years kids, young uh, young families. Hey, man, I've, I've been an intern one time in, during college. I was a middle school, high school intern, and I had the responsibility of staying up late and walking the camp pr- premises, make sure there's no students outside mm. their dorm. So that was like 11, 30, 12. And then I had the privilege of getting up and waking everyone up with the camp wake up. Oh, that's great. And putting up the flag. Mm. Those were the days. Yeah. Those were the days, man. Fun days, though. I had a really yeah. great time. I love I love student ministry. I think it's, you know, it was instrumental in my faith. Oh, I got saved in student yeah. ministries. Yeah. So, but also, you know, Calvary Kids is doing some really cool things, too. So they not are. to just give some love to them. The student ministry department. Yeah, so as I talk about how how student ministries is fantastic, as you heard in that trajectory, I switched from student ministries to kids and young families. So uh, I could show you, I, I saw that as a bit of a step up Yeah. because of how much I love kids ministry. I was the interim kids director when I was a student minister at my campus. And I hated, I hated making crafts. And getting them organized for volunteers mm-hmm. for the week. It was like the bane of my existence was that. I was like, I'm, I want it out of here as soon as I can. I love these kids. I can tell them funny stories. We can open up the Bible. But I do not want to organize crafts. Mm. I was like, it was painful. Yeah. Jay's, you know, you learn as you do life and as you serve in a local church, you learn what you're good at and what you're not good at. I'm excited to learn what I'm good at someday. <laughs> Hey, I'm good at sweeping around here. Yeah. Yeah, man. Change out the toilet paper rolls. That's great. Bathroom, man. That's really good. Yeah. Okay, so we've been on the weekend. Uh, we went to the weekend, remember? Mm-hmm. Calvary blessed us, blessed Calvary by um, just inviting everyone from Calvary to weekend, remember? We had a good turnout down in Colorado Springs. It was at a really swanky hotel called the Broadmoor. Which I had never been there before. Yeah, me neither. And it was an amazing place to spend the weekend. So what's your reflection from Weekend to Remember? What do the people at Calvary who missed out need to know? Uh, so just, th- this is more surface level observation. So Gary had mentioned that we'd all be sitting together and there is a part of me that just silently revolted. And then a, a smaller part yeah. that uh, audibly revolted to, to Gary, my supervisor, of <laughs> the thought of, of us sitting all together. But and then the, when we got there. A marriage retreat. Yeah. We're working on your marriage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and just seeing how much of a presence Calvary had. Like, we were a sixth of yeah. of what it was. Like, it, it was a huge section. of Like, we got called out from the stage a couple times. Yeah, we that, did. So it was, it was really cool to see how many people were coming out to uh, work on marriages, which is something that is so important. We talked about the value of kids' ministry, the value of student ministries. Well, the spiritual lives of kids, the the mental, uh, physical, and emotional health of kids and students is impacted by what's going on in the marriage. So yeah. I'm so grateful to see how many how many folks were, were coming out for that. And, uh, yeah, the, the big takeaway for Emily and I, uh, we were debriefing it, was just that structured time. Like it, we, we have a lot of content. We've been around churches for a while. I've taught on marriages, uh, despite being not married for super long. Uh, grateful for Paul was setting the example of can speak into issues that don't have a ton of, uh, experience himself. So grateful to have that as right. a example for me to be able to do the same. Um, uh, on a much, much lesser level. <laughs> um, but but we have a lot of content. What was really helpful is we don't often build in our time together, uh, whatever that may be, of hey, how is our spiritual life? Uh, how do we resolve conflict? Is there any grievances that we've been hanging on to? Mm-hmm. Um, where can we work on communication? And so just having a list of questions for us to check in on and time that said, like, hey, you're doing this right now, mm-hmm. uh, that was really beneficial. Like, we'd get time together. Uh, we'd have a date night, which was scheduled for us, um, but to use it in that intentional way is something that we would have missed out on if we weren't on this conference. Yeah, the big word for me is intentionality. Yeah. And that's in all of If you're single here at Calvary, if you're in college in Calvary, if you're a retiree in Calvary, if you're a student or a kid at Calvary, if you're married, just being about intentional about your life and really making most wisest decisions you can 
and by living in a rhythm that sets you up for success. And that that's intentional. And I think the we can remember was just about remembering your intentions and setting new intentions yeah. as you move forward. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, man. That's really good. Okay, so we wrapped up this series. Last week, we had these um, guests. Well, we had a guest speaker here, Matthew and Thornton, John and Boulder. We're starting a new series this week. But before mm-hmm. we get there, since I haven't talked to you in a few weeks, we finished up Beyond Blue. Yes. Which is a heavy series. Well, spoilers for this week. Like we're presenting this passage in a different way, but James starts off with with kind of a Beyond Blue intro. No to, doubt. Yeah. No doubt. But as your as your own journey through mm-hmm. a sermon series, your own journey with these topics, what have you learned in the last four weeks or what will you take away in your in this season of preaching and thinking and hearing? Um, these ideas that were happening in Beyond Blue. Yeah, I, so I, I think it's so good because uh, much of my inclination to responding to difficulty is to uh, react as normal people do with despair, despondency, uh, feeling the hurt, the pain, the suffering, with doubts, with, with with the whole gamut of emotions. And yet there's that part of me that says like, I gotta, I gotta buck up. I, I gotta look to be a stronger uh, Christian than I'm really feeling right now. I, I gotta, I gotta perform. I, uh, I gotta uh, deny that these are truly going on and uh, just go back to God is good, even though I'm not feeling like God is good. Uh, we do need to get there, but uh, that that pressure of Christians aren't supposed to be struggling with this. I need to make myself look better than I'm really doing. Like it, there's that pressure with inside of me. Some of that could be the role, uh, the the profession that, that God has called me to. Some of that could be a whole variety uh, of reasons. But but there's that part of me that says I'm not allowed to feel this pain. I need to pretend that I still feel like everything's going great. And, and it, just having so many examples throughout Scripture of people who don't interact that way. Um, or there's the things are going wrong. What did I do to cause this? And while certainly God uses things in the Old Testament to bring, uh, I, so John said it uh, in in his message uh, that I thought it was so well uh, said that that God used the circumstances to bring um, uh, people cl- uh, Israel closer to Him. But in Christ, we have been brought near to him. And so we don't have the same experiences that that um, Israel did. I am butchered it, but fortunately yeah. we have three recordings of John's message uh, from from this series. So go and find it, and it's said so much be- better than, than I am saying it. Uh, but, but that reminder of uh, just because I'm experiencing this doesn't mean I'm being punished for a sin that I committed in fourth grade that now God is inflicting pain upon me because of this. So it's just so much of my natural inclinations to responding to difficulty are dismantled by looking at the lives of people in scripture Mm -hmm. and grateful that we had the opportunity to see people who say the same words that we do feel the same way that we do. And yet they're not smited. Uh, They're, they're not, uh, God doesn't cut them off, um, and instead we seek patience, we seek love, we see people brought, are reminded that he is near them. Yeah. What do you think about this sort of season we're in, in American culture, where mental health is pushed to the forefront? Mm-hmm. We're probably talking about it more openly than we've ever have. Um, the value of it, we know, we have more and more people in our circle of friends and family who go to mental health professionals. What do you think you see out of that in American culture with our sort of biblical worldview? Hmm. Yeah. So first and foremost is the, it, the the piece that I'm talking about is the acknowledgement that, yeah, this is a broken world. Mm-hmm. There There is a lot that hurts and harms and damages us. Uh, it's not ever asking us to pretend otherwise. Uh, and Yet, in the midst of that, we are given a constant hope mm-hmm. that uh, really, when when we're going through things that we've gone through, what 
what other hope is there other than uh, the the truth that Jesus has come, the truth that he's coming back, the truth that God is going to make all things new again. Uh, there, when we are going through these times when uh, we're, de- we're depressed, and I mean actually depressed, or when we uh, just feel so much worry within us, um, we can give what sounds like cliche truth of there is hope, there is more beyond this, it, and we might not be ready to hear that, but it's the ultimate truth that we need in these times that what we are experiencing is not the end, yeah. that there is a belief that there is more than this, that you don't have to pretend otherwise, that God sees that this place is broken, mm-hmm. and that's why he has a plan in place to, to restore things. Yeah. My natural bend also, I think, in the last couple of years too, is like the holistic view of a, what a disciple of Jesus looks like it's just not fact or information based faith. You know what I mean? In the sense of that's what defines you. Those help define you. Mm-hmm. But Jesus created me in the Imago Day, which is the image of God. He knit me in my mother's womb. Mm-hmm. We find out. Um, and that he really cares about my whole person approach to following him. Yeah. So when mental health comes into that, he meets us there and he. He has tools for us to um, grow in our trust t- with him, our walk with him, our faith, grow in our, d- our identity. Excuse me. And I think that's just a really beautiful thing that that's getting pressed to the forefront of us following Jesus is that there's a holistic approach to following Christ. Yeah. I yeah. just, I find hope in that. And I think it's a, it's a better, I think the, the church is getting better at understanding that we are um, human beings that are disciples instead of just thinking beings that are disciples or obeying beings that are just disciples. And I think that's a really wonderful new forefront for the Christian faith. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you want a mature Christian who has a healthy emotional life? I mean, that would be unique, wouldn't it? It'd be really it's a beautiful expression of what Jesus can do in someone's life instead of just them knowing the right answers, knowing the beliefs, knowing why they believe, obeying, but not being, you know, being angry all the time or having, you know, uh, whatever it is sort of in their personality that keeps you away from the faith. Mm. So I find hope in that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's hopeful. All right. Let's turn the corner here. Actually, you know what? No, let's not turn the corner. I, I, I was going to throw, I'm going to throw this out because I think it was really unique. Uh, your T.S. Eliot quote in your messages. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, one, first and foremost, I love T.S. Eliot's mm-hmm. quotes. They're amazing. Yeah. His writing is complex. Um, but I think this is one of the most interesting lines he ever penned. Do you remember that quote? We will not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know it for the first time. It's off the top of my head. Now, yeah. I said it three times on each campus, yeah. or one time each on each campus, but uh, I, I think I got it pretty close Yeah, you there. got it really yeah. close. Yeah. I, I think that's a really unique thing to say in that season, that we don't arrive. We always, every day is the beginning, right? Mm-hmm of what God's going to do. Isn't that unique? Yeah. You think it's frustrating for Christians to realize yes. that? Yeah. <laughs> what was your question? But yeah. the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> I knew it's going there. It's, it's a Christian faith. If you could give a picture of the Christian faith, would it be like a mountain you climb? Is it a linear progression? What, what to you sort of symbolizes the Christian faith of, you know, repentance and restoration and all those things that sort of play in the Christian faith? Uh, the stock market <laughs> would, would probably be uh, the, the best example. There is movement every single day, mm-hmm. uh, upwards at times consistently, some drops even in the day where it's still moving upward at yeah. the end of it. Uh, you get times like 2008 where there's a big old <laughs> drop in there. 
Uh, you get other times where you get consistent climbing in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it is it is one where you overall it, it, it seems uh, as we are continuing to pursue God, we are drawing closer and closer to Him and more and more likeness to Him. Um, but if you look at a particular snapshot moment in there, you may not see that at all. Mm-hmm. But if you zoom out for the duration of your Christian life, you see incremental movement mm. towards mm-hmm. him. That's really cool. I like that. That's really good. Okay, we uh, can move on now. So the uh, last thing on it. So yeah. uh, we're never going to move on from this. <laughs> uh, so last thing, uh, just the, the personal part that was really cool for me was getting to do that rotation of getting to go to Boulder, mm. of getting to, to preach at Erie for my, my first time. Right. Um, uh, for some reason, it decided to snow two feet mm. the last time that I was scheduled to preach at Erie. And, and we, uh, again, I don't know why we did this, but we canceled services that Sunday. Like We did? Yeah. Cl- I don't remember. Clearly, that. it was easy to traverse that two terrain snow. Uh, two months into living in a state that had snow for me. And so, yeah. That's great, really funny. Great I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember that. That's really fun. Yeah. Uh, so was glad to be out here and, and, uh, it was incredibly encouraging for me just to have, uh, people who've been part of Calvary for a while come up and say, Hey, we, we've been praying for you guys since go three, mm-hmm. or, uh, I haven't been out there since I was out there helping do drywall. Um, just, just hearing all of those stories, uh, and, and it was really special. So we, last month we celebrated one year of meet together as a church and just to hear the faithfulness of people's prayer lives mm-hmm. and their thoughts and love for us out in Thornton, it, it was so nourishing for me. And, and uh, that the the series has been really helpful in a really tough time. But just the reminder that we aren't put in these times alone. That there's been difficulty in the first year of being a church mm-hmm. planting in a pandemic, and just to have those those faithful Christians, those, those, uh, th- that great cloud of witnesses mm-hmm. that we have come alongside of us and say, Hey, we've been with you in it like that. That's been real, real yeah. helpful. That's really cool. Zach. I'm glad, I'm glad you added that. That's really good. Cool. It's really cool to see God's faithfulness over a very long time and sort of the answer of prayers. We see answers to prayers all the time, mm. but it's really good to see these big answers to prayer. Yeah. You know? It's really neat. Okay, right. so we're going into this new series, uh, the book of James. I want to talk about sort of the biographical sketch of the person of James. Great. I think it's a really unique chance, since we're not talking about a verse yet, to sort of get a rough outline of what we know of James. Yeah, so who is this James? There's lots of James in the Bible. There's lots of James in the first century, Yes. There's very, a lot of them. Very common name. Very common name. I, from a historical perspective, a very church history historical perspective, James seems to be the brother of Jesus. Yes. Uh, and your caveat is important because you can find scholarship on just about anything that Christianity holds to be true, and there are scholars who debate it, people who are teaching at prestigious institutions, people with more training than you and I have combined, uh, will look at this and say, nope, it's not James, the brother of Jesus. But we see church uh, Christians throughout church history have said this is James, brother of Jesus. We see plenty of reasons within the letter, within uh, study, to mm-hmm. say that it is. And there are plenty of Pete scholars who do say, yes, James, the brother of Jesus, right yep. here. Don't you wish now that you know that in the book of James, he would say, James, the brother of Jesus, right? No. Here. Why not? I'm so glad he does. Like, if I am trying to lend a credibility to something, I'm throwing a ton of lies on it, if mm. if that's the case. So if, if I'm writing this sec- second century, James has already passed away, but I'm trying to get people to believe that it is me, I'm throwing all those credential pieces in there. Mm. Instead, I so much more prefer what James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James, says. He says uh, that he is servant of God and Jesus Christ, which I love so much more 
because it's showing uh, it's much more important to, to show that he is a follower of Jesus than a blood relative, which mm-hmm. I think is really special. Uh, and then just on a more silly side, like imagine having, imagine doing that. Uh, you, I, I, you have a sister. Yep. Yeah. I have two sisters. Uh, imagine what it would be like for us to grow up with uh, our, our sisters and, and think of around 30 something years old, I'm actually going to call myself a servant of my sister. Mm -hmm. It is impossible with the history that I have with them. And yet we see that life change in Jesus in James, where he is more interested in being known as a servant of God and Jesus Christ than anything else. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing, Zach. I like that. I like that a lot. There's another book of the Bible that's written historically Mm. been called a, the same uh, a brother of Jesus. So there's two books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Jude is that book. Correct. And in Jude, he opens up and he says, I'm brother of James. Yes. Which is another thing. They, It seems like the deity of Jesus really keeps them from saying, I'm th- his brother. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. And that, w- that would make sense. Him. I wouldn't, if I grew up with Jesus, if he was, you know, Mary and Joseph were my dad, mom, and I, Jesus, my older brother, and then I've seen what he's done. And in fact, historic, historically, there, there is a great view that James was actually at the resurrection mm-hmm. um, in the early church. And so if I had seen that, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not related to that guy because I can't do that. Yeah, and we see this in the Gospels too, right? Jesus goes to Nazareth, and he's, and he's doing all the same works, all the same teaching that he was doing elsewhere. And they say, wait, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know this guy? Like, how can we believe that he is the Messiah? And we don't have James listed, but uh, it seems like he might be next uh, in line of birth order. So kind yeah. of taking on that, uh, that, f- that firstborn status with Jesus uh, going off to his ministry. We would assume that he's there with Mary waiting outside uh, when someone comes up to Jesus and says, hey, your family's uh, out here for you. Because Jesus is doing things that look very shameful to the family. Mm-hmm. They're, they're trying to pull him away from this. And Jesus says, who's my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of my father are my bro- bro- mother and my sister and my brothers, which is a very dishonoring thing to say to the family. So we have these instances where those who know Jesus growing up uh, are less likely to follow him. And then James says, I, my my blood relation is less important than my spiritual relation to Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's really important. What credibility does that give to the resurrection itself? Mm-hmm. You know, in that, I mean, if my sister t- claimed to be the s- savior of the world, you know, I would not claim her as my sister anymore yeah uh we we get my sister into an institution for that (laughs) which there already was plenty of times growing up that i wanted to do that so this would just be the the final push (laughs) that's hilarious yeah you know and i think it just shows so much of actually who jesus was that two of his brothers end up really becoming spiritual figures within the early church yeah and to the point where uh, we might be jumping ahead. James oh. gets talked about elsewhere throughout the Bible. We see his transformation in uh, Acts 15 is one that I love. He goes from potentially being one to pull Jesus out of that area to then stepping up and saying something that just shows his transformation. We see him talked about in Galatians 1.19, uh, but this transformation so much so to the point that following Jesus leads to his death. Yeah. In fact, you mentioned Galatians 1.19, that's where Paul comes back to Jerusalem and he only meets with James. Mm -hmm. So it means the importance of like figures, religious figures, Christian leaders in the turn of the first century, right after the resurrection of Jesus, James is promoted to being a very central spiritual leader among the early church in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Like uh, imagine that job posting. Like I can't even think of what the equivalent it's, uh, yeah, it's it's like the central place for. I mean, Jesus was was crucified outside your your front door, and totally. and James is the leader of that church. Yep, no doubt. It's just really unique and really interesting. So, the earliest of the possible dates of James, the book of James, would be what? 
40 to 50 AD. Yeah, like 45 is, is what gets thrown out there for like an early writing date. So he's one of maybe the earliest books of the New Testament. Yes. One so of not the earliest. That, that would be assuming that it got written down initially first, which we don't know if that was the case. Maybe it was something that was said out loud before, but with it being written to uh, uh, chapter one tells us to the 12 tribes and the dispersion. So Jewish, Jewish Christians spread throughout the world. That's how I understand that mm-hmm. to, to be um, probably written down. Um, and this would be, 10, 12, 15 years after Jesus was crucified. Yeah, pretty amazing. And, and if you read the James, you also see that James is, has a different tone than most of the other New Testament writings, uh, would you say? I don't A know. different flavor? So the, we see similarities. So it, it's similar at times to First Peter. Yeah. Uh, it seems like they were kind of speaking similarly, but to different groups. First mm-hmm. Peter seems to have some Jewish Christians in mind, but maybe some some non uh, Jewish Christians as well. There, there's a lot of similarities with Sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. Um, so totally. th- there's there's some pockets throughout the New Testament that that feel similar. But but yeah, it, it, there there are some parts that are unique to it. So it has more imperatives, uh, more commands per word than any other New Testament book. Which is why it gives the title of the New Testament version of Proverbs. Yeah, in or, some ways, or even like Leviticus at times, yeah. like how how do you remain pure in Leviticus versus how do you remain a faithful follower of Jesus? Hmm. That's interesting. I've never heard that connection between Leviticus and James. Um, that's really cool. I really like that. So, sort of the historical. We don't know. Uh, I can't. I have to give this caveat. We don't know one hundred percent the life of James. Mm-hmm. We do have church history. Mm-hmm. We do have reliable church history yep. that has given us some great stories of James or actually some names of James. He was named James the Just, mm-hmm. which is a sort of a nickname that people gave him. They also gave him the nickname of Old Camel Knees, mm-hmm. which you were like, why would that? But if you ever looked at camel's knees, they're callous and hard and they have a little pocket. And that meant that James was known for praying. Yeah. He was always on his knees, which is a beautiful thing. Like, this, if you're going to be named, if you're going to have a nickname, that's a good nickname. Yeah. Old Camel Knees, you know what I mean? It shows you who you are. So what else do we know about James from a historical church history perspective? Yeah, so we talked about him being at the Church of Jerusalem. We talked about how he's talked. Uh, he's mentioned in quite a few New Testament uh, passages. We talked about how uh, he was uh he died um so how did he die so tradition tells us that he was pushed off uh the top of the building possibly even the very church that he was leading in jerusalem uh when that did not fully do the trick um the crowd resorted to stoning as was common at that place Uh, get your kids out of the room 30 seconds ago if that's difficult to hear yeah yeah, that's a really, I mean, Fox Book of Martyrs talks about that, mm-hmm. which is um, just a really, if you don't own the book of Fox Book of Martyrs, that's a really good book to sort of have on your shelf. If you don't own a very updated translation Yes, that's it, a re- yeah. really important. Because it's an goodie. older book, and, and you can't find an older English translation of it that, that might get a modern riveting to everybody. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, James dies that way in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's really interesting that the brother of Jesus is willing to die and just gives another credibility of the resurrection, right? Yeah. He's willing to die for his brother who raised from the dead. Yep. Uh, Difficulty of saying you're the servant of a sibling that you saw raised uh, already there of calling, uh, yeah, of transforming your life to follow after him and then to do so to the point of death. Like that there is... Yeah, this is always one of the apologetic statements of right. why would these uh, disciples, these apostles, have died for Jesus, gone through all of this pain to deny themselves so much for something that they just co-opted in the upper room, made up, stole a body, who knows? Why Why would they go through all of this? If I if I have a mob about to push me off a building and it's something I made up, that that's when I'm coming clean. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. And... That's not what happens to James. Nope. He dies. He's a 
great figure in the early church, helps define who the early church will be, helps navigate some very tough topics of the early church, Mm -hmm. like ethnicity and racism and favoritism. Yep. Those are big words, but I think that's really important. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the book. You looking forward to the book? Oh, so much. Uh, it is It is a favorite of mine. Uh, one of my, my favorite professors in undergrad, uh, Dr. Lockett, he did his dissertation in James. Oh, wrote, that's cool. Yeah, wrote a, a book on uh, the this, this section, the general letters, um, this part of the Bible that, that James falls into. Um, so it's good to, to return to to some of those things. And, and it's one of the most quotable books of the New Testament throughout uh, as it's coming back to that key ver- I think James 1, 22 is kind of the key verse of the whole thing. Be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Um, that as we are following after Jesus as a disciple of him, learning who he is, growing in obedience, making disciples of others, which is the pattern that's given to us in Matthew 28, we are not just hearing what he says, but we are actually putting it into place in that stock market trajectory of ups and downs and falls and, and peaks, uh, incrementally growing and being doers of the word. Oh, man, Zach, that's a great place to end. Calvary, we hope you join us as you get better at being doers of the word, as we get better at being doers of the word, that you would come alongside us, jump in a community, be known, know others, know your scriptures, know the living God, and come to a personal relationship with him, and then then help us be doers of the word, right? Mm-hmm. We're so glad you're listening this week. If you got a question about the book of James, something that's really unclear, you can always write us at theweekly at calvarybible.com. We would love to hear from you. Go straight to that admin that you're hiring for the, for the role. Totally, yeah. yeah, no doubt. And also give us a review on whatever version of the podcasting world you listen to the weekly. We love reviews. As long as they're five stars. Mm. That's the best type of review, right? That's right. Five star review. Yeah. If it's a four and a half, we'll 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 live with that. But we love you. Talk to you soon.